In previous video, we have discussed two things that you must know before learning how JavaScript works behind the scene. Where we discussed the relation between ECMAScript and web browsers and then we discussed how JavaScript became just-in-time compiled language. I have given the link in video description and inside the iCard top right corner. Now let's look at what is happening behind the scene when you run a JavaScript file within the popular JavaScript engine V8, which is found in Chrome web browsers and in Node.js applications. Though there are other JavaScript engines, once you understand how V8 works, then you could easily compare its working with other JavaScript engines. Now enough with the introduction, let's get started with the topic. So first of all, here we have the major components in V8 engine and the picture shows how they process a JavaScript file. First of all, we have a parser which is the first step in translating any human readable program to a lower level or machine readable code. The main objective of a parser is to check whether the program is written according to the JavaScript language syntax rules. If not, then the statements not following the syntax rules must be shown as an error with necessary details. The steps that we follow in a programming language parser are exactly what we follow when we learn new spoken languages like English, Spanish, German, etc. Consider the following sentence. To make sure whether this sentence is correct or not, we take the complete sentence and we will separate the parts of the sentence into subject, verb, object, etc. And then we will check whether the sentence is constructed according to the grammar of the language. In English, it follows the grammatical rule subject plus verb and followed by the object. So it's a valid sentence according to English language. This is what we exactly follow in V8 parser also. There are two stages in a V8 parser, lexical analysis and syntactic analysis. Through lexical analysis, the whole program is scanned and broken down into different components, often called tokens, like identifiers, operators, keywords, literals, etc. Like we have done with our English sentence. And during syntactic analysis, we check whether the generated tokens forms a meaningful JavaScript expression with the help of JavaScript syntax rules. Now let's explain the same with a JavaScript program containing the function get full name, which takes an object as a parameter consisting of first name, middle name, and last name properties. And then the function returns the generated full name with the given names. Since middle name is optional, we have a ternary operator to append the same in between first name and last name if it is present. And here we have called the function with sample names. For rest of the discussion, only this function declaration is used. Let's check the lifecycle of this JavaScript function within V8 engine. So the whole process is starting from this parser. And inside the parser, first of all, we have lexical analysis. During lexical analysis, the whole program is broken down into different tokens. As you can see, inside this function declaration here, function and return will be marked as keywords and then whatever names or labels that we use to refer components inside the program comes under identifiers, such as function name, parameter name, property from the object, etc. And these concatenation operators comes under the operator. And whatever the fixed values inside the program, like these white space or empty string, comes under literals. And rest of the symbols, whether it is closing and opening of these parentheses or curly brackets or these columns or question mark comes under punctuations. So in this way, the whole program is converted into a stream of tokens. And these tokens are the input to the next stage, which is the syntactic analysis. During this syntactic analysis, we have to check whether the written program is correct or not with the help of JavaScript syntax rules. To do that, during syntactic analysis, the whole program is represented in a data structure like this tree here. And this tree-like structure is called as abstract syntax tree, often abbreviated as AST. So let's check how this tree is created from this function declaration here. And let's check how this tree helps the parser to check whether this written program is correct according to the syntactic rules. So let's start with this root node itself. First of all, parser identifies this function definition as a function declaration. That's what we have inside this root node here. And then the body of the function is wrapped within a pair of curly brackets. As I mentioned before, everything wrapped within a pair of curly brackets is what we call dog statement. Inside the function, we only have a return statement. So that's what we have here, return statement. Now, if you look into this expression here, we have multiple operations. But inside this AST here, we will consider one operation at a time. So that's why we have this binary expression, meaning we are only considering two operators at a time. So this plus operator is referring to this concatenation operation here, 
So on the right hand side, we have this uh, member expression, meaning we are trying to access a member or property of this object. So that's pretty simple. Now on the left hand side of this concatenation operation, we have a big expression. At a time, one operation is considered like we have done here, and that's how this subtree here is generated. So here we have the binary expression, meaning it is representing this concatenation operation here. On the right hand side, we have this ternary operation, which is often called conditional expression. On the left hand side, we have another concatenation, and that is what we have expressed with this uh, bi binary expression. See a simple concatenation between uh, this first name and this uh, white space here. Now when it comes to conditional expression, we have three parts. So first of all, we have the condition here. If it is true, meaning if the middle name is present, then this expression is executed. That is what we have expressed with this binary expression node here. Just a concatenation between middle name and white space. If middle name is not present, an empty string is written. That's what we have here. So three parts of the conditional expression. So the whole program is represented with this AST data structure. Now how this AST helps the parser to check whether the written program is correct or not. For that the parser will check the syntactic rules from the leaf nodes of this tree here. For now we'll just consider the operator. Here we have a concatenation operation between these two strings. So it's valid according to the uh, JavaScript syntax rules. But instead of this plus operator, suppose we have a multiplication operator, it won't work because multiplication can't be done with two strings. So the whole program execution will be stopped and the error will be shown with necessary details. But in this program, we have a concatenation operation between two strings, it is valid. The result of this concatenation will be again a string. Now, when it comes to this conditional expression here, whether this condition is true or not, it will return under the string. Because here also we have concatenation between two strings, it will return a string. Here we have a literal string. So whatever the value of this expression here, it always returns a string type. Then again, we have a concatenation between string and string, which returns another string. And here we have the final concatenation. So the whole process from leaf to the root node will be verified. For the sake of this explanation, I have only considered the operator and the type of its operand. But in a real life, there are a lot of things to be considered when it is verifying with the JavaScript syntax rules. So if all of them is correctly verified from bottom to this root node, and that's how a parser identifies whether the written program is correct or not. So after this parser, we have this abstract syntax tree. Now the program should go through ignition interpreter and turbo fan. And this is where the important task of an engine happens, which is the translation of the program into a lower level or machine readable format. And this is where JavaScript engine manufacturers implement their intellectual ideas to make the engine more efficient. In brief, Ignition Interpreter converts the program to a lower level bytecode. And when necessary, this bytecode will be converted to machine code using this turbofan here. Before getting into further explanation of Ignition and turbofan, I want to remind you with something. Before V8 version 5.9, instead of the compilers, Ignition and turbofan, full code gen and crankshaft were doing these operations. Not a change of name, they were different in action also. Don't confuse with these terms, I just want to explain what's the reason for this change. So full code gen was the baseline compiler, meaning the compiler where most of the translation is done. Where the program is converted to architecture specific machine code. No optimization was done during this process, so all of the optimization are left to the crankshaft. The original motive for switching from this configuration to the new architecture is that the output generated by full code gen was consuming one third of the RAM, especially on mobile devices. Once it is replaced with Ignition Interpreter, the generated bytecode shrank by a factor of 9 because the bytecode generated by Ignition is more concise. Now let's look at what is really happening with Ignition and Turbofan. As I said, the output from Ignition Interpreter is a bytecode where all the operations are specified with these commands similar to the assembly language commands. As I said, the generated bytecode is more concise compared to the previous full code gen output. But how can we execute this bytecode when our machine can only understand binary codes with zeros and ones? To execute the program, this bytecode is interpreted by an outside interpreter 
which does what these instructions imply. So that's how a statement is getting executed in V8 engine. Now what does this turbo fan do? Because after ignition itself, all necessary steps like translating and executing the program is done. Here turbo fan handles the optimization of the bytecode when necessary. Let me explain. During the program execution at ignition interpreter, it monitors or save runtime profile information and feedback. Based on that, frequently executed part of the program is marked as hotspot. Suppose if our function is getting invoked multiple times, then then it will be marked as hotspot. Then this information is passed to the turbo fan so that it can convert the corresponding bytecode to architecture specific machine code, which gives the maximum speed for the hotspot, which in turn makes the hot program to execute at a much faster pace. In this way, turbo fan ignores generating machine code for procedures that are less frequently executed. It saves both memory and time. Turbo fan not only converts the bytecode to machine code, but it also or does various optimization techniques. I will explain a few of them. If you want to know more about them, you can go through the reference that I have given in the video description. As the execution progresses, the ignition interpreter collects the analysis information or feedback of various operations, mainly the type of input for an operation. It will be helpful for further optimization of the program. I will be explaining this with an example. Once the engine categorizes inputs for an operation into different types, turbofan can optimize the operation for a particular type of input so that it can avoid unwanted steps involved in the operation if same type of input comes in subsequent runs. This type of optimization based on assuming same type of input in subsequent runs is called speculative optimization. And here we will be discussing these two optimizations, hidden class and inline cache. Consider accessing a property from an object. It might look easy for us, but for the compiler, it's not. For example, the given object might be undefined or there is no property with the given name. The property is not present in the object, but it is in the prototype, means it is inherited from other object, etc. By considering the fact that JavaScript is a dynamically typed language, this becomes even complicated, means the developer can modify an object anywhere in the program later. So to make such operations more efficient, V8 engine creates hidden classes. You might be familiar with classes from other languages where we have to specify the structure of the data upfront. Such type of user-defined classes helps the runtime environment of such languages. Now when you create a JavaScript object as you wish, internally V8 engine creates hidden classes to store the necessary information of the object. And these are called as inline caching. So inside the inline cache, there will be a hidden classes stored. So for the first time, when V8 engine encounter an object like this, the corresponding hidden class will be saved into the inline cache. Inside that, we'll be having the structure of the class. In subsequent runs, when we pass another object with same structure, then V8 engine can make use of the already saved hidden class of the same type and it can make use of the necessary informations required for accessing properties from this object and other informations also. Here these two objects is having the same structure, so that will be another hidden class. Now accessing properties from these objects becomes more easier, because all the necessary information is there inside the inline cache. Since this object is matching with the already saved hidden class, it helps the engine to avoid a lot of the overhead. If you want to access the first name from this object, suppose the object is saved at the address xp, then in order to access the property first name, you just need to use the offset 50. So accessing properties becomes more easier. Like this, there can be a lot of information helpful for the subsequent runs of the same type of object. Now let me explain how speculative optimizations like this becomes helpful. Now consider objects with only these two properties, first name and last name, as a parameter for this function. Suppose to this function get full name, we are only passing objects with these two properties, first name and last name. So V8 can create a corresponding hidden class with these two properties, first name and last name, and the necessary information will be saved in inline cache. Now here comes the speculative optimization. Since there is no property middle name, this entire operation can be skipped. So a turbofan will convert the bytecode of this function without this middle name 
to this architecture specific machine code here. Now that's how speculative optimization works. Now remember this, the machine code that we have just generated is only applicable to the uh, hidden class with these two properties, first name and last name only. When an object with these three parameters are passed, the optimized machine code will be bailed out because it, it is not matching with the optimized hidden class. Bail out the optimized code and the corresponding bytecode will be used to execute the function. So that's how speculative optimization works. To dig deep into the topics that we have discussed here, you can refer the video description. I have given the necessary reference there. So that's all for this video. In next video, we'll be discussing call stack. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing to this channel, Code of Friction. Please like and share this video with your friends and colleagues. See you in next session.